Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 79 of Compliance into the Weed, a podcast where, with my good friend and colleague Matt Kelly, we take a deep dive going literally into the weeds to consider a compliance or compliance related topic. Today, we take up the recent imbroglio involving Starbucks and their having arrested two African American males who were waiting in a Philadelphia Starbucks location for a colleague for a business meeting. We consider it from the compliance perspective, from the leadership perspective, and several other perspectives. I think there are lots of lessons to be learned, both from the uh, Starbucks side, the store manager side, the employee side, and the compliance practitioner side. It's a fascinating exploration of an event which is literally still on the front pages of the news. Compliance into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back with another episode of Compliance into the Weeds with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance. Today, we're going to take a look at Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks uh, recently had a uh, as negative a reputational event as one may have, I think. And uh, both Matt and I uh, blogged about it. Uh, I think this is something that compliance practitioners are going to be talking about a, a long time. So, Matt, I, I would assume everyone's heard about it, but for the few of our listeners who have not, you want to set the stage and then we'll go from there? Yeah, sure. So the news is that uh, this incident happened, I want to say, about 10 days ago, I think now, um, that two black men uh, in Rittenhouse Square, Philadelphia. So for those who are not familiar, this is like right in downtown Philadelphia. It was very well-to-do part of Philly, but still like downtown urban core. Uh, These two black men by the name of Dante Robinson and Roshan Nelson, they walked into the Starbucks and we should probably lay out the facts fairly clearly. They walked in. First, one of them asked to use the bathroom and they had not yet purchased any products. So the manager at that Starbucks said, no, it is reserved for customers only. Then they sat down at a table to wait for a third person uh, who was going to come and apparently meet them for a business meeting. So the manager walked over to them again at their table and said, are you going to buy anything? And uh, apparently they said, no, they were not. They were waiting for someone. Um, I'm not even clear on if they actually said we are waiting for somebody, but they did say we are not going to buy anything at this moment. So the manager then went back and two minutes later, she called police to have them uh, roust uh, these two guys out of Starbucks um, under suspicion of uh, trespassing. And this clearly smacked two people in Starbucks who were largely white, that this was racism, that there were plenty of people there who were not in any particular hurry to buy anything, that some woman had come in and used the bathroom without buying anything. And as they were getting arrested, their third friend, Uh, who is white, he showed up and he started politely but firmly questioning the police about why is it necessary to arrest them. This is racism. White people don't get treated that way at Starbucks. Um, And this was all caught on video, which was then uploaded and has been viewed at least 11 million times over the last week or so. Uh, And this did lead to, uh, as you diplomatically said, Tom, a negative reputational event for Starbucks. Um, quite the quite the negative, that's for sure. So, Matt, I really found uh, just an incredible plethora of compliance issues, uh, compliance points, ethics, values, and lots of other things we try to talk about on this podcast in this event. You really, uh, I thought, had a great. Uh, first of all, uh, I would acknowledge that you wrote uh, your blog post about Starbucks at a Starbucks, which I thought was just as meta as it could get. Um, <laughs> I will not ask you uh, if you purchased anything, but um, you really took started off uh, by looking at policy versus judgment, and I think that's as, as really a good a place as any to start. Yeah, and um, for the record, I yeah I did write this at a Starbucks in Harvard Square, and I did buy a uh, vanilla iced coffee as I usually do at Starbucks. Um, but I myself, I hang out at Starbucks all the time, and I would guzzle that iced coffee in five minutes and then stay there for another two hours. I mean, clearly, a lot of people have it in their head of what the Starbucks experience is like. 
And I think that is a point not to be dismissed because Starbucks invests a lot in promoting that idea of the Starbucks experience. They call it the third place. It is not the office. It is not home. It is where you can hang out and feel welcome. What does that actually mean in practice? And that's where the policies that Starbucks puts forward to achieve that third place vibe, um, I think that they are very blurry. Uh, I Apparently, and I know, Tom, you've looked into this maybe a bit more than me, but apparently Starbucks doesn't really have a clear policy on how long you can stay in a store before you must buy something, when the bathrooms may or may not be open only to paying customers or seats only to paying customers. Um, it isn't much of a big deal in my neighborhood because it's very rare that you can even find a seat at a, most of the Starbucks I go to unless I show up at like two minutes after they open. But nonetheless, um, you know, I, I struggle with this because I think – Starbucks needed to give flexibility to that manager and to lots of managers in major urban areas because there are homeless people who do come into Starbucks um, to loiter around because they need a place to stay. Uh, in Boston, at least, we've had several media stories about how bathrooms at coffee shops, Starbucks or otherwise, uh, that is a very popular place for heroin junkies to go in and uh, shoot up and they might leave their needles uh, behind or they might stash them behind a toilet and things like that. And that's led to a lot of policies at a lot of coffee shops saying you're only for paying customers. There needs to be some flexibility because I suspect this is not always the case at all the Starbucks in non-urban parts of the country. So I don't fault Starbucks for empowering their managers to use judgment. However, it does then raise the question of, are these managers properly trained to spot any implicit biases, biases they may have, or just they use uh, the images of race as some sort of very sloppy, very inappropriate mental shortcut that if you're black, you're more likely to be doing heroin or be homeless. So therefore, I'm going to crack down on you more than I would some nice white person. That's really what we're getting at here. Um, it's a bad practice. It shouldn't be allowed. But how do you address that without some draconian thing like a sign on every single Starbucks on the planet saying seats for paying customers only, please purchase first? Because that gets back to what we said earlier, like the Starbucks third way. Well, that's it's kind of a strict jerky way to be a third way in a third place. I don't know if I'd like that. That's That's the mess that Starbucks has right now. So I saw really uh, several different things uh, uh, came to mind from from me reading your blog post and and going on uh, and going on uh, as well. What I did not see in any of the descriptions of the events I've read was that the manager or Starbucks representative asked uh, the gentleman to leave if they were not going to purchase anything. And so I really fault the manager or whoever made the decision to call the police because I, I always feel like once you call the police, you've, you've then moved it to a law enforcement uh, mechanism. Um, I don't really see the police uh, ha having the training to de-escalate an issue if an allegation of trespass is made. I think uh, I would certainly expect the police to... Um, respond with a law enforcement response. Unfortunately, if we go back to United and hauling the uh, passenger off the plane, uh, that was my sense of the police response or the airport police response there and the police response here. Uh, we should note that the two men were released. No charges were filed against them. Uh, but the, I didn't see an escalation, or that's probably not the right term. I didn't see the manager engaging in a series of questions that would lead one to properly diagnose that this was a, a trespass. Um, the other thing, though, I started really thinking about what is Starbucks is Starbucks, uh, I mean, I, and I'm like you, I work at Starbucks, I meet people at Starbucks. Uh, almost all of my business meetings are generally, what's the closest Starbucks we can meet at? Uh, even more than the ubiquitous lunch or dinner meeting now, it's, you know, what's the closest Starbucks? Because you can go in and out and, and have a relatively mm -hmm. short and certainly inexpensive, uh, because I do buy a drink as well as you do, uh, business meetings. So I see Starbucks as having evolved really as to something 
um, not even a coffee shop anymore, not really not even the third way. Uh, I really see it as, as part of the community fabric and a community green or a community square or something that community uh, can go to as a place separate and apart from uh, some uh, a coffee shop. So uh, that really led me to think about if if your goal is to be a community square or a community green, should you have a different set of risks uh, that you need to uh, evaluate, forecast, assess, and then train on those risks? The um, um, training on the 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 or I should say the manager's response. Uh, I was very disturbed by that. It clearly seemed to me um, that she went to a racial bias position very quickly, and I, that sends, I think, a, a terrible message. I think Starbucks is going to be reeling from from this message. Uh, now, um, Starbucks has announced that they are going to have a one-half day, uh, I don't know if it's worldwide, but certainly nationwide uh, closure of stores to put on training, and I certainly applaud them for that. But is that, uh, n- not that that's too little too late, but is that a type of policy response that you would advocate they engage in? Well, I mean, it's a crisis management version of a good policy move that probably should have been happening in piecemeal with new hires for a long time. But I think given the uh, negative reputational event that happened, I actually do think that Starbucks has done a fairly good job trying to defuse this as best as possible when it really doesn't have too many good things going for it right now. But uh, the CEO, um, I think his name is Kevin Anderson, uh, he did apologize almost immediately uh, publicly on TV, and then he went to Philadelphia and then met both men um, privately and apologized again. I know that uh, the founder of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, he also went on TV, said this is not what we are about, this is not what we want, um, and then taking that step of the training, like you know, it, there there really is, there's going to be a whole lot of being taken to the woodshed on this that Starbucks, I think, knows, and they're going willingly, and they understand what's coming next, but they're taking all the necessary steps that you should take after this has happened. The one point I would raise though, Tom, I I agree with you entirely about the manager and how she could have prevented this before, you know, you and I and compliance professionals everywhere, we spend so much time talking about a risk-based approach to due diligence. She had to perform to due diligence on two guys sitting around in her store And she could have stepped up to them and said, look, guys, I don't want to give you a hard time, but policy says if you don't buy something within five or 10 minutes, I'm going to have to tell you to leave. And if you don't, I'm going to have to go and call the cops. She could have given them breathing space to see it from her perspective. And they probably then they seem like reasonable guys to me would have said, sure, two bucks, somebody gets a small iced coffee and then this diffuses it all. And it never would have happened. It is not on the customers to reach that conclusion. It is on the manager to decide how to do this. And her due diligence instead was two black guys sitting around, not going to buy anything, call the cops. Um, that is, that's not how it works. That leads to all sorts of problems. And look where we are. The other point uh, you mentioned about the police, what I was struck by is in the full video that I've seen, which is about 10 minutes long. You can see right around the six minute mark, their friend has shown up and he is asking the police what's going on. And he says, all right, why don't we three of them? Why don't we just go somewhere else? And the police tell him we asked him to leave already. And they said, no, we're past that point. And I struggle with the police's role in this because to a certain extent, I appreciate that they have to go through proper procedures once things are put into motion and the manager put it into motion. Nonetheless, I kind of wish that they had also used their own good judgment to say this is one of those times where clearly these guys aren't any physical threat. Clearly, these guys got the shaft from a manager who is insensitive. But if all three of them are willing to leave, there's no need to arrest them, which turned out there wasn't because they released them within a few hours. 
Um, and it also, it, I didn't mention this in my post, but I dad thought about that United Airlines incident where the police were called to really just roust a guy off of a flight because he refused to be bounced. Um, and, you know, there was no crime being committed by that man. So I, you know, I kind of wish that the Chicago airport police in that occasion last year had said to the airlines, there's no crime being committed here. The police have no role. This is your mess. Goodbye. Um, and, you know, again, it, it, all of it is really about learning when to exercise judgment that says, let's depart from policy this time and do something that achieves the bigger objective anyways. And I know compliance officers are uncomfortable with that idea of using judgment to depart from stated policy, but still for a larger purpose that makes sense. That's that's an uncomfortable thing for compliance officers to contemplate, but occasionally that is necessary. And training the employees to be able to figure that out, that's really what I think a big part of employee training needs to be. You know, Matt, that seems suspiciously like the term operationalizing compliance to me. Um, you know, I, it's also suspiciously like common sense. And, <laughs> um, you know, you, you got to wonder sometimes about how can we inculcate common sense? Um, it's difficult. It's I, I will give Starbucks a, a small bit of sympathy. They have one hundred and seventy five thousand employees. They have high turnover. And so, therefore, they constantly have to find people with enough ability to make judgments. And then you have to invest the money to train them to make judgments. And, and you have a day job of running a coffee empire and making money for shareholders and investors. It's not easy. But however much money that would have cost, I bet it will be less than the, the PR black eye and the sort of sunk hidden costs of, of this negative reputational event that uh, they did suffer. You said one phrase that really struck me, Matt, I'd like to pick up on just for a moment, which is that it's not the customer's responsibility here. It's the the business enterprises. It's Starbucks. It's the store in the person of a senior executive at the store who's the manager. And that was the uh, <clears throat> one of the fail failures we saw in United Airlines was when the president, uh, the CEO of United, after the event, blamed the passenger for being drug off the plane. Uh, you didn't, at least you didn't see that from Starbucks here. But that's something that companies really need to understand, that it's their responsibility to either diffuse the situation, to properly assess the situation, and provide training for those who have to make that assessment. And um, I really hadn't thought about it and or ha heard it put quite that way, but um, it, it's the company's responsibility not to pay the bribe. It's the company's responsibility uh, not to engage in this sort of uh, behavior. And that's that's something that we don't really say, I think, enough, which is that it's your responsibility. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, like in an FCPA context, you, it would become absurd. You know, it's not the, the third party's responsibility to perform its own anti-bribery efforts for your behalf, is it's on you, the company. But in this um, more consumer-focused context with United and Starbucks, like, look, I get it that once these customers were slighted the first time, they became somewhat sticks in the mud. Um, you know what? It is their right to be a stick in the mud, and especially if you are a black person in America, you you have had a long history of being mistreated, and when you get mistreated again. It is perfectly natural for these two guys to say, you know what, I am not going to leave because there is a historical context where they've been ordered to be in the back of the bus, to be at the back of the coffee shop. You know, they, they are entitled to do what they want so long as they are not being abnormally or, I guess, illegally inappropriate. And they worked. Uh, it is up to the manager to come over and figure out how to treat them respectfully and how to integrate them into the Starbucks experience. And it probably could have been done if she had just gone over and said, guys, I can let you stay here for a few minutes, but if your friend's running late, you have to buy something here and then you can stay for the next two hours. Like I said before, they seem like reasonable people. I don't think any reasonable person confronted with that would say, no, I'm going to continue my, my crusade and be a stick in the mud. They probably would have said, sure, here's $2. We're going to be here for another couple of hours. And none of this would have happened. But it was all on the manager to bring those conditions about, and she did not. 
Well, Matt, this has really been a fascinating exploration. Uh, I think this one uh, is going to be studied uh, for some time. It's going to be interesting to see what Starbucks comes up with in the form of its uh, <clears throat> um, anti-racial bias training or other uh, stand downs it may do around this. Um, and uh, I'm sure they'll come out stronger at the end of this, but it's a great lesson for policy, procedure, judgment, common sense, the responsibility of the company, and a whole lot of other things. So great post, and thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can reach Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. You can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our ratings and help get the word out about the only weekly podcast that takes a deep dive into a compliance or compliance-related topic. Thanks again for listening this week, and I hope you'll join us again next week when Matt and I explore another compliance topic into the weeds. Compliance into the weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.